most typical boxing films, or just films with boxers, you are usually introduced to a dynamic of them being underdogs that are trying to overcome their limitations in the hopes of winning a championship. Or, on the much more interesting side of the spectrum, we have talented fighters who probably fight to fulfill the objectives of clandestine sports betting conspiracies. Many of the things that I have mentioned mirror reality and are things that have happened in the golden age of boxing and are still happening to this day. But with this knowledge in mind, it has become clear to me that what really generates the drama in a spectator sport like boxing isn't the individual narratives or clash of ideals amongst competitors, but the monetary gains to be made in the business of boxing. So, in Metal of Box, the main protagonist is Joe, aka Junkyard, a talented boxer who subjects himself to the humiliation of getting his ass kicked by third-rate boxers for the sake of making easy money, which he probably questions in the opening of the first episode, as he has a monologue that clearly hints on the internal conflict he has been dealing with. Having to choose between a mediocre career that barely gives him a decent living, or to aim for the stars, embarking on the romanticized idea of facing a worthy adversary in the boxing ring and giving it your all. Joe's manager and partner in crime, Nanbu, on the other hand, has a less dignified sense of purpose and lives mainly to survive. He has capitulated to a disgraceful state while dancing to the tune of the mobster Ujimaki, making Joe throw away fights in order to tip the scales for whatever plans have been contrived for the sake of enriching those Ujimaki wants to win in his gambling schemes. Apart from that, he forgoes the promise that he made to Joe of allowing him to win this particular match, probably due to having lost money at the dog betting place he was at. This could be conjecture on my part, but it seems highly likely with Nambu's distinct behavior of fixing fights and being indebted to the mob that this is the case. Essentially what guides the actions of Nambu are his connections to Fujimaki, the sinister looking man who ultimately plays a major role in the progression of the plot, forging fake IDs that make it possible for Joe to compete for Megalonia. However, this fierce persona is not only there to just give Nambu pressure but actually represents the dark side to the business of boxing. The relationship of boxing and the mob, or generally any involvement of powerful forces, accentuates well the saddening notion of boxing as a gambling ruse. It is quite clear that Fujimaki and all those who enforce athletes to throw away matches are not concerned with the individual narratives of boxers. Whether one has genuine skill over the other serves no purpose in determining the market forces that play to the benefit of those fixing matches. Boxers become tectonic plates, shifted in ways that follow a strict script that's based on whatever evaluations were placed at sports betting hubs. With the ramifications of violence and possible death, an athlete would do well to follow the stage precedents rather than pursue the sport with genuine intentions. The sharp contrast to the boxers in Joe's situation would be Yuri, the champion who came from nothing and shows reverence to the Shirato organization. He is living the greener side of life as well as Mikio Shirato, a man born into wealth and wanting to prove that his way works in the hopes of usurping his sister, Yukio Shirato. It becomes clear that those in Yuri's position have more flexibility and freedom of choice, presumably due to how the environment and fortune conveys that sense of freedom. But for the stray dogs of the boxing world, the gambling world is guiding their careers without their consent. Fujimaki, who engineers the forgery of Joe's ID, does it to eventually take a huge cut from the prize money Joe would win from Megalonia. Since Joe had been established as a match-fixing tool, there is no guarantee that this victory in the finals against Yuri would free him from his burdens of poverty because Fujimaki could just use the fact that he orchestrated the opportunity for Joe to enter Megalonia as an excuse to trap him in more match-fixing schemes. In episode 10, Fujimaki grows impatient and tells Nanbu to convince Joe to throw away an important match so that he can bank a huge load of money. Being the businessman mobster who doesn't want to incur any risks, he probably didn't believe in Joe's chances. Or, in a different take on it, a gambling opportunity showed up to bank a lot of money and he decided to screw both Nanbu and Joe's plans because in his world, money isn't powered by dreams, but by taking chances that spite those dreams. 
This belief system transcends this anime and crosses over into the real world. So, during the golden age of boxing, there were many conspiracies and investigations concerning boxers throwing away matches. One of them was about the brawler boxer Jake Lomata, a man whose association with the mafia led him to opportunities of winning the championship as well as intentionally losing fights for the sake of boosting his boss's gambling business. Jake later on testified that on the promise of him having to get a chance at the title, he threw away a match at the boxing ring for his boss. This put the man who engineered the match fixing behind bars, but sadly this did not end his business of exploiting boxers for gambling schemes. In another case, which doesn't have a happy ending, was the infamous ghost punch that came from the rematch between Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston. This match mostly received much criticism due to how dubious its conclusion seemed. And in my opinion, there's no way Sonny Liston, a big titan of strength, could KO to a jab on the lower jaw like that. The only way to justify such an obvious match throwaway would be Sonny submitting to a higher power. In this case, the mob. Sonny Liston was an ex-convict with the deep ties to the Mafia and probably met his end due to a targeted hit by the Mafia. In the two examples I mentioned, both boxers' decisions were influenced by an entity trying to make the most profits out of a gambling scheme. The sad thing is that, typically, the kinds of boxers who would fall into this trap were people who came from nothing, non-entities in society that could only rely on their fists getting a helping hand from organizations that could care less about their boxing potential but rather how they could raise the odds in their favor in a match-fixing scheme. This is what you'd call a nightmarish reality with choices but a fallacy and the favorable gambling odds dictate whether or not a boxer gets to win a match. A world where your talent doesn't matter and everything is manufactured to fulfill a specific financial goal. This is what Joe is dealing with and I guess many other athletes in the world who have been bribed or coerced with threats of violence to lose matches that they could have given their all to win. As a disclaimer for those who might end up misunderstanding me, I'm not singling out boxing as the only sport prone to match fixing because this stuff happens to almost every spectator sport in the world, from esports to even air racing. But what interests me is how why not deal with such a conundrum? How is Joe dealing with the fact that by some chance, if he wins and doesn't end up throwing away a match, he could get killed by the Mafia? I get a sense that when Joe accelerated his bike to ram over the cliff, he really wanted to commit suicide, but only half-assed the execution because that's not how Joe wants to end his life. The opening monologue hints on the fact that he is dissatisfied with his current lifestyle and wants to break out of his routine which is clearly not going anywhere because for all the matches he has thrown away, his life hasn't improved dramatically and he is still living a shitty life, looks broke and has no girlfriend. Probably the lack of a girlfriend was a creative decision on the writing staff's part, so I could be just seeking morbid humor at this point. But what I do believe is that throughout the 10 out of 13 episodes of Make Low Box that I have seen, Joe has come to terms with the fact that the gambling world run by the mobsters doesn't care about him and that the boxer throws away matches to make a living lifestyle isn't for him rather than playing to the fear of the backlash he is going to get for following his dreams or settling in for less in the world's worst example of job security a boxer throws away matches for the mob Joe is going to fight for his dreams even at the cost of his life the romanticized fatality of Megalobox is apparent with the way the show teases us at the end of every episode stating not yet dead. I believe that whatever decision Joe decides to make which goes against the business model of the gambling system engineered by the mob will ultimately result in his death. This sounds like Joe is cornered and I believe that if Megalobox follows in the footsteps of its predecessor Ashida no Joe, Joe will definitely die on the last episode of this anime. However, from a less postmodernist take of the series, I realize that if the world is really rigged against you, and essentially you are screwed, why suffer through the indifferent terms of the system? 
Why should you continue this routine that perpetuates a horrible life for you? This, my audience, is what Megalobox answers. Joe has decided to die for his dreams, to show his talent and worth in the boxing ring regardless of the consequences. It's one thing to aspire for your hobbies, to desire a change in your life, but not everyone is willing to die for their ideals. And I believe that Joe represents the theme of the willingness to die for your dreams. The belief that you will put in the effort to make your dreams into a reality. He overcame his fear of not having gear in a match and accepted that his opponents have an advantage over him. But this didn't stop him. Joe even makes it seem as if fighting without the gear was a gimmick to Yuri, even though we both know that he was too broke to afford his own gear. Basically, he has enough self-interest to not tell his competition the embarrassing reason behind something that ended up making him an icon. Joe represents the masculinity that's missing in our modern age of getting things done for yourself, especially in a world where people feel entitled to things and complain about almost everything under the sun. The world doesn't owe Joe anything, but has rather put him at a disadvantage, which might actually not be one. If you ever wondered why Joe has better endurance and can handle more punches than other fighters, it's probably because he developed a tolerance through intentionally losing a lot of fights. Not all fake outs are painless. And I think that in a way it helped. But overall, I believe that Joe represents a man's romance. The idea of being willing to die for your passions, to weather any storm that tries to stop you from succeeding in your goals in life. So my final question to you all is, are you willing to die for your dreams? Thank you for watching and if you enjoyed this video and are new to this channel, consider subscribing and don't forget to hit that bell for notifications because, well, YouTube subscriptions will sadly become a thing of the past. This is the first video of the channel and I would like to thank you all for joining me on the inception of this channel. I am the Great Bastino, covering content related to anime, manga, Korean dramas, film scripts as well as EDM and baby metal. You can follow me on my Twitter at BastinoMika to get more from me and consider supporting me on Patreon where you will get access to extra exclusive content as well as my audiobooks. So, it's a wrap from your boy, the GB.